baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Chapter 4 and verse 13. Esther chapter 4 and verse 13. Then I'd like to turn to Esther chapter 8, verse 5. But first, Esther 4 and 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. I just for some reason, I didn't really see this until Brother Pugh preached this message, but kind of what he was talking about, Esther now finds herself in that predicament. She finds herself in that position. And this is her answer to this great crisis. This is her answer to the season of life that she finds herself in. Then Esther bade them return, Mordecai, this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Chapter 8, verse 5. Now she's coming down to the point where we've got to write a higher law to contradict or counteract the law that Haman set into motion. If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the things seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, which he wrote to destroy the Jews which are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people, or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred. One translation says, I can't take watching my people die. And I want to preach to you from this text, made for a mission. I believe that we have a reason to be here. And it is our obligation to the saving grace of Jesus Christ to discover what that reason is. And to give ourselves to it so that we can produce it to the glory of Almighty God. Every one of us have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And God wants us to discover what that is in this service this afternoon. And I want you to open up your heart and let God anoint your mind so that you can receive it in Jesus' name. Thank God for His wonderful power. Jesus, we love you today. We thank you for this beautiful, awesome spirit. I believe that you're going to do something mighty in this service. God, thank you for what's already happened. I thank you for anointing Brother Pew so tremendously to bless my heart with the Word of God. But touch every mind and spirit in this building that they might receive their mission and go forth to accomplish God's purpose. We can't take it any other way, God. We want it your way, Lord. And we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you do something for me before you're seated? Would you clap your hands unto the Lord and magnify Him? Would you do that? Rejoice in Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. I have a good report to give you. We are seeing unprecedented revival in the United Pentecostal Church all over North America, not just the world, but in North America as well. 
As a matter of fact, up to this point with 25 districts reporting and about 20% of the churches in those districts reporting, we have seen over 5,000 young people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost since January 1st. I want you to know that the time for us to realize our destiny is now. If we're going to have revival, we might as well not put it off to another time. We might as well go on and say, our hour is today. I believe we've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe that it's time for us to rise up and not make excuses for our powerlessness, but stand up with a new voice and a new hope in our hearts, understanding that God is going to work miracles in this hour to bring this revival to pass. I'm going to tell you what I like about this revival that I'm experiencing and seeing all around North America. It's not just happening in a few places But it's happening in all kinds of churches, small churches, home missionary churches, large churches. It doesn't make any difference where everybody's getting together and wanting with one mind and one accord to see God move. They're experiencing Holy Ghost revival. Now, I don't know how you feel about it today, but I'm going to tell you that I have come to this place with this understanding that I can't take it any other way except for God to move with power in our midst and give us the revival that he has promised this church. I've heard it promised all my life, and I believe that my God is fulfilling that promise right now, and I want to take a hold of it in Jesus' name and see it in every church in the Indiana District, every church in the United Pentecostal Church. I want to see every one of them experience a Holy Ghost revival. Come on, we don't need to get upset when God starts blessing those across the street and those that are down the way. We need to let God give revival to whomsoever He will. If they're preaching the truth and believing the gospel, let God do it. I believe that God has already purposed in his heart to perform this. He just needs a willing vessel through whom he can convey it. Esther came to the kingdom for such a time as this to release God to do what he already wanted to do. God had already decided what he wanted to do. He just needed somebody that he could use to accomplish the purpose. I believe that God's already determined what what he wants to do. I think he's just looking for somebody right now through whom he can convey this Holy Ghost revival. He's just looking for a vessel. He's just looking for somebody right now that will make themselves available to the presence of the Lord. I believe that if we will allow God in this service right now to choose us as that vessel, I believe that he will realize his purpose in us and that the enemy will not prevail. I believe this revival includes a deliverance. I don't think they come in and stay the same that they are when they walk in, but I believe they walk out a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. I want a deliverance in this hour to set us free from our depressed state of mind that keeps us from rejoicing in Jesus and finding what God really has for us. I refuse to sit back and let the devil run all over us and beat us up in the, in his own unholy name and try to take credit for all the things that are going bad. I want the Holy Ghost to rise up in this hour and give us a deliverance to overcome the powers of darkness and see a revival break out like never before. I'm sorry, I'm not going to sit back and let the devil run all over the United Pentecostal Church and our people uh, and give us a complex to where we can't break out uh, and experience what God wants us to have. I don't care what label they put on us. Let them call us what they want to. I want to be what God wants us to be. You shouldn't have to walk in here with your mind all bowed up and your spirit all bowed up about something. You ought to be free and liberated in the Holy Ghost so you can magnify the name of Jesus and glorify God Almighty. Come on, we need a deliverance in this hour. God wants to do something powerful and He needs somebody that's got the faith. I'm going to tell you something that this deliverance also includes an enlargement. God not only wants to set us free, but he also wants to enlarge us and make us bigger. I don't care what size your church is, it's not big enough. I don't care how many missionaries we've got, we need more. 
Say, well, we're struggling with the finances. I don't care. We need more missionaries than we've ever had in our entire history. We have not saturated the market. I still believe there's a lot of people that need to hear this gospel and need to hear this message, and we're not big enough yet. This conference isn't big enough yet. We need to pack it out with people that are hungry for God, wanting to, to hear a word so they can go home and bring about deliverance and revival to the people. we got to get that kind of mentality in our mind and our spirit where we say, I've got to stretch out and grow just a little bit. And I don't think we need to be afraid of declaring it either. I don't think we need to be ashamed of standing in the pulpit and expecting God to do something powerful like He's promised in the Word of the Lord. Come on, we need to get some, deli- get some deliverance from some concepts that have got us bound. We need to shake them off in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, we might as well go on and admit it. We like to be entertained in the Pentecostal movement. Uh, and if the choir is in a certain way uh, and we're not being entertained in a certain measure, then God's presence is not in the house. Uh, that is foolishness. Uh, your performance uh, does not bring God's presence in this place. Uh, your togetherness uh, and your unity does. Come on, we need to get delivered from that kind of entertainment mentality where they've got to put on a show to get us worked up in the spirit or something. We don't need that. We need to get together in one mind and one accord and walk in this place and believe that my God's Word is true. God wants to make it bigger. I said God wants to increase it. God wants to make it larger. God wants to deliver us from those mentalities that keep us from doing it. I think we ought to break out in our spirit right now and just say, God, I've come to the kingdom for such a time as this, and I'm not going to have it any other way. But I want you to notice something about this deliverance, because we're not going to get it unless we learn how to present ourselves to the king. And you can't just present yourself to the king in just any way you want to and get, gain acceptance in his presence. As a matter of fact, she could not come before the king according to the law. She had no legal right to come before the king. And only if the king were to lift the golden scepter to her would she gain audience. And if not, then she was dead. Well, I want you to understand something here. We have got to present ourselves to the king in the right measure. Because she couldn't do it according to the law. But you see, she was counting on something better than the law. She had a relationship with the king. An intimacy with the king that gave her access to his presence. And after she fasted and after she prayed, she presented herself to the king, not according to the law, but according to her relationship. I don't believe anybody should have to hang us over hell to get us to move in the Holy Ghost. And press on us and reprimand us to get us into the presence of God. But I believe there ought to be a relationship that we have with Jesus Christ that just causes that well of living water to spring up into everlasting life. Nobody should have to make you magnify the Lord in this service here today. There ought to be something in your innermost being that says, I can't help but magnify the Lord. I don't believe that we ought to have to force anybody to do anything they don't want to do. But if you've got a desire in your heart, you ought to worship God with all your soul, mind, and strength. If you've got a relationship, why don't you come before the king? If you really love him, why don't you come before the king? If you really care about the cause, why don't you come before the king? But I'm hurting. I'm frail. I'm weak. You may be all of that, but you still got a God who cares about you. Present yourself to him. Whenever Esther presented herself to the king after her days in fasting, the King James Version does not bring this out, but the Septuagint does. She, has, she was so weak from her fasting, not eating and drinking, that when she presented herself to the king, she fainted when he turned his eyes and that glaring stare at her. She fainted and she swooned. And the king leaped from his throne and picked her up in his arms and cradled her head in his arms 
and spoke kind words to her. I don't care how hurting you are, how frail the situation might be. When you present yourself to the king, he's going to receive you. And he's going to leap from his throne. And he's going to pick you up in his arms. And he's going to cradle your head in his arms. And he's going to speak soft words to you. Say, but I just don't feel like it. I don't care what you feel like. Go ahead and lift up Jesus in the house and see what the Lord will work on your behalf. Oh, Brother Kinsey, you don't understand what's going on in my life. I may not understand it, but I do know this. If you'll present yourself to the king right now, you've got a relationship with him that qualifies you uh, to go in before him and gain an audience uh, like nothing else. Uh, And I think it's time for us to press our advantage uh, and present ourselves in the presence of the Lord uh, and say, God, uh, you want to give us a deliverance and enlargement. Uh, I'm here uh, to be used for that purpose. And I know you've heard it before, but my friend, God can bypass us and go find somebody who will yield themselves to God. But before he does, I'm going to stop him in his tracks and say, God, don't bypass me. I want to see you move. Friend, I'm going to tell you, God's going to bring it to pass somehow. He might as well use the United Pentecostal Church. He might as well use those of you that are in this house. But Esther did three things that released God to deliver the Jews. She allowed God to use her as a channel to bring about this deliverance, but she did three things to position herself properly so that she could be used by God. The first thing is that she received the suggestions of the chamberlain, and she required only what the chamberlain suggested. And she beautified herself and got herself ready to be presented to the king Therefore, she would be accepted in his presence. Well, I want you to understand something. We need a chamberlain. Now, I know that everyone here has got a pastor or someone that they look to that is in leadership that they look to for guidance and wisdom. But right now, as far as this service is concerned, I bees the chamberlain. And I am the chamberlain here in this service this afternoon. And whatever I suggest, If you want to position yourself right to bring about deliverance and revival, you have got to require of yourself what the chamberlain suggests. Now, I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just suggesting that you do it. I'm not commanding anybody to do it. I'm just suggesting that you do it. I think everybody in the house ought to clap their hands to the Lord. You know what I think? I think we ought to get excited about the simple truths of the gospel that we believe and know is right. We got too much pressure on leadership now to try to pull something out of the hat. Why don't we just hear a good old-fashioned message about Jesus' name, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost? There's still power in that message to bring about any kind of revival you'll ever want. I think you ought to receive the suggestion. I'm just suggesting that we ought, to, we ought to start rejoicing in Jesus and quit feeling down about the price we have to pay and traumatize and victimize because we got to come to church and live for God. I think it's time we get out of that kind of mentality and we get a joy in our spirit about what we're doing. I'm going to tell you, if you're going to live for God, Brother Pew's already told us, we're going to pay a price. We're just going to have to get down to the nitty-gritty and decide we're going to go on. But you might as well go on and put a smile on that face and start rejoicing in what my God wants to produce. Come on, the Chamberlain is here making the suggestion. You need to beautify yourself with the suggestion. See, when you begin to follow that lead, that's when God begins to perform a great work. And I I want to just share a truth with you that really revolutionized my evangelistic ministry when God showed it to me. And I always, in my early years, I don't know why I got this concept or where I got it, but I just seemed to have it that I thought everybody in the house ought, ought to have to get with me before God would produce the miracle. Everybody's got to be behind me before I can have revival. 
So I'd get up and I'd make statements like this. And I would, I would stand in the pulpit and I would make statements like this. I'd say, now, everybody in this house needs to worship God or we're not going to have revival. And I'd make statements like that. And that's not the truth. Because the Bible says, where two agree touching any one thing, it shall be done. And you know what? I learned something there. I don't have to have everybody behind me to have a move of God. I just need somebody to agree with me here today, and God will move. Hey, we don't need everybody in the house behind us, and everybody don't need to pray, and everybody don't need to worship for God to move. I just need to find somebody to come into agreement with me, uh, and the Holy Ghost will start operating with power. I think it's time for us to get a spirit of agreement because the promises of God are in Him. Yay! And in Him, amen! Come on, we got enough of this no spirit. We got enough of this no world in us. We need to get some yes in our heart. Come on, if God's going to move, you can't just sit there always contradicting what's going on in the pulpit, saying, I wish it were done different, and I wish He'd do this, and I wish He'd do that. Oh, we got to get our minds on what the purpose is. Uh, quit worrying about what this man's doing. Uh, just get into sync with what the Holy Ghost wants uh, and say, God, do it! Now, I'm just suggesting this. But I just want you to know that this word amen means different things in different languages. In one particular language, it's actually three yeses said repeatedly on an ascending scale. Yes! 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 That's what amen is in their language. And I think we need to get a little bit of that in our language because that's what our world's trying to teach us. Just say no to drugs, but you can't say no to something until you said yes to something better. And we, we're trying to teach people to say no, but they need to, they need to be taught to say yes to Jesus. Because when you found something better, it's easy to say no when you got something better. Now, you might as well go on and admit it. That's the first word you learned when you was growing up. No! Put that down. No! Eat your dinner. No! Shut up. No! Go to sleep. No! How many of you remember saying it? How many of you have had it said to you? How many of you have felt like you was in a battle with a five-year-old and the five-year-old was winning? Uh Uh-huh. I figured that out. But I want you to understand it's time for us to change that spirit. I think we ought to be a yes church in a no world. I think everybody in this house ought to come into agreement with the Chamberlain and receive the suggestion and say, God, I may not feel much, but I do believe that your word is true. Some of you, you're not agreeing with it yet. You need to start saying yes. You don't agree with nothing. The pastor gets up and wants to go through a building front so he can make room to have this revival. And you're saying no. And you ought to say yes. Now, now, actually, there, there's four yeses in this verse. All the promises of God are in him. Yay. That's yes. That's Greek for yes. And in him. Amen. Well, no, that's actually four yeses, but that first yes is your agreement. But that, those other three yeses is your excitement and enthusiasm to bring it to pass. Now, I just think that there ought to be something just welling up on the inside of us whenever the gospel is preached, whenever the purpose is presented, and we understand what our mission is, and the Chamberlain is suggestion, suggesting what we ought to do in order to bring it to pass. I think that we ought to get a spirit of agreement. I think you ought to say yes to it. But then I think you ought to get excited about it and get enthused about it. And not and not get that, look, I've heard this stuff before, because most of the time when we say three yeses, we say, yeah, 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 it's on a descending scale. And we need to, yeah, 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 you know, we've heard this before, but you don't need that kind of spirit. You need that other kind that says, yes! God's deliverance and God's purpose is just as true right now as it has ever been. And He's wanting a church somewhere through whom He can convey His deliverance. I want to know, is it going to be you? Is it going to be you? 
Is it going to be Indianapolis? Is it going to be the rest of the United Pentecostal Church? God is wanting our agreement. Yes, you need a chamberlain directing and suggesting what must be done. But this is, this is the kind of attitude that we got to have and we got to get it in our spirit. Tommy, Brandon, come on up here. I want you to be the blessings of God. I got to illustrate this for you because you got to see it. I want you to go stand over there and you're going to be the blessings of God. You're going to follow behind me and you're going to stop when I stop, go slow when I go slow. And then when I pass the pulpit, I want you to run up behind me and scare me. Okay, you got it? But I got to pass the pulpit first. All right. Well, the Bible says it very simply in, in the book of Deuteronomy. It says the blessing shall overtake thee. That means it's going to catch up with you if you hang around long enough. But if you don't ever start the process, it's never going to happen. And somebody's got to start the process because the gifts and the blessings, the signs, the wonders and the miracles, they always come behind you. They always follow you. So you've got to start the process. But I don't feel anything. Do it anyhow. But you don't understand what I'm going through. I may not understand what you're going through, but I promise you this works. I proved it in my own life. If you'll go ahead and present yourself to the king according to your relationship, not your emotional condition. God does not change according to your emotions. I don't care how up you are now. That doesn't make God any more powerful. I don't care how down you are. That doesn't make God weak. God's the same whether you're up or down. Doesn't make any difference. So what you got to do is start the process and the blessing shall overtake thee. When you begin, the blessings begin. And they're following you around. Some of you don't even realize it, but there's a deliverance that's been following you around all week long about to catch up with you in this service. Some of you have been struggling in your city to try to get a breakthrough and the enemy's doing everything he can to stop revival. But I feel a miracle following you around in this place right now. Say, but Brother Kinsey, I don't understand what's going on. If you'll go ahead and present yourself to the king and say, I've got a relationship with him. He loves me. If you'll go on and present it, the blessing will catch up to you. Don't stop just because you might be disillusioned right now. Don't stop just because you're frustrated. Keep on. Come on, I'm just making suggestions, uh, but you ought to require it of yourself. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, blessings, I want you to go around this aisle and I want you to meet me down this middle aisle right here. Just go around, just right there. I believe God's already got the date marked on the calendar when the blessings going to catch up with you. I, I, I just believe God's already got the route mapped out because I believe that our steps are directed by the Lord. I believe that our path is made by God. And I think what we ought to do is we ought to just stay in the way. When it seems like it's not going to work, go on and keep doing the right thing anyhow. Because the blessings are going to meet up with you and God's already got it marked on the calendar when it's going to happen. You and the blessings. Have a divine appointment with God. Come on. This blessing is not going to leave you. My God is true. My God is faithful. Why don't you hang in there? Praise God. I want you to know that this great revival that we're seeing all over the world, I'm so excited about it. I don't hardly know what to do with myself. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I have preached this kind of revival all of my life, even when I was just a little old kid preacher. I started preaching when I was 13, and I went full-time when I was 18, and I'm, I'm still in it. And I still believe the message. Oh, yes, it gets frustrating at times, and it's a struggle, and you get tired, and you get weary, and all of that kind of stuff, but I'm still going to present myself to the king. I said, I'm still going to come before the king, struggling, frail, weak, beat up, beat down, bruised. Up. But I'm coming before the king because I have this attitude. I can't take it any other way. i got to see God work. i got to see God move.
Man, I remember when I was 18 and 19 years old, I'd preach about this great revival that was going to come and it was going to be greater than the book of Acts and everybody laughed at me. And they said, oh, boy, that little kid, boy, he's just so excited and, you know, he'll settle down. But I never settled down and I still believe that. And I'm going to be honest with you. All right, can I get honest? I quit preaching that because I got embarrassed by it because people embarrassed me so much about it. I just stopped preaching it. And I said, no, I'm not going to preach it. And then it got to burning in me like a fire. And I said, I, I, I just shut up in my bones and I just can't stop this thing. I got to let it go. And somebody pulled me aside and said, you're afraid to declare what God's put in your heart. And I said, well, not anymore. So I got up and I started believing God and started preaching it again. And guess what? It's happening right now. And you can sit there with your no attitude if you want to and maybe say yes with your mouth and look no with your face. But I'm going to tell you right now, we were made for this. You hear me? We were made for this. We weren't made to warm a bench. We weren't made just to sit around and let somebody entertain us. And I think it's time for us to get into that spiritual mindset where we are not traumatized or victimized by what we have to go through to the point where we got to go through six months of therapy before we can lift our hand and praise God again. This is not a therapy session. I hope you get healed. I hope you get blessed. And I hope the Word of God gives you direction and all of that good stuff. But this is not a therapy session. Mm, Some people, they just want sympathy. They, They don't want deliverance. They don't want healing. They don't want to get out of the mess they're in. They want to stay in it because they built a religion around it. I can't take that kind of stuff. i got to have something better than that. And I know I found it in the Word of God. And it's here right now. All right, the second thing she did is she knew that she was going to have to challenge the enemy. She knew... That praying and fasting and presenting herself to the king was not all that needed to be done. She had to challenge the enemy. And she knew that as queen, that the law that was set in motion was more powerful than she was. She did not have the authority to change that law. It was there on a certain, certain date. Everybody's going to rise up and they're going to kill the Jews. It's exactly what's going to happen throughout all provinces of the Babylonian Empire. That's what's going to happen. And so she knew that she had to challenge the enemy. Well, you might as well get ready for it. We're going to have to challenge the enemy. And we're going to have to be brave enough to put up a fight in Jesus' name. Now, I don't know what your experience is, but every time I've started preaching revival where it's not happening, trouble breaks out. And some people had rather not have the revival because of the trouble it brings. Because it is trouble. People get your seat, they get your parking place. You get all kinds of crazy people coming to church. I remember when I was just a young preacher back at Brother Thornton's church in Lake Charles. And uh, I was just sitting on the front row, had a bad spirit because all the hippies and the yippies were coming to church and getting the Holy Ghost. And Brother Thornton was using them and not me. And they had these exciting testimonies about all the great things that were going on, you know. How God saved him from this and from that. And, and, and I wasn't being used. And I was just sitting right there on that front row. And, and he wasn't using me. And I, I got a bad attitude. I said, uh, God, what's going on here? I'm called to preach. And he's using all these hippies and these yippies that are coming in here. And they're, and, and they're praising God. And they're all excited. And the Lord spoke to me and said, if you get off your backside and start worshiping me like they do, maybe I would use you too. I learned something there because I think it's time for us to get into a spiritual mindset that when we come to the house of God, we ought to come expecting something to happen. Instead of this dull attitude that says, "Uh uh-oh, one more church service and feeling traumatized because you got to go. Victimized because the preacher calls one more fast day or one more revival. We got to get out of that mindset. We got to get excited about this thing. Fasting's tough for all of us. And it's getting tougher the older I get. But I want you to understand that we're going to have to stand up to the enemy in the name of Jesus. 
But she had a certain way to do it. She didn't just come out directly and confront him, but she got two banquets together and she decided instead of trying to confront him directly, she would please the king. So she prepared the banquet and set the king down at the banquet. She pleased the king because she knew she didn't have the authority to handle the enemy, but the king does. I'm going to tell you that we don't need to know the name of every devil to whip him. We just need to know the name of the one who's already whipped him. Come on now. Jesus Christ can handle this enemy. All we need is somebody to please the king. If you'll prepare the banquet and please the king, my God will handle the enemy on your behalf. I don't think we ought to just take it sitting down either. I think we ought to just let the enemy know we're not going to stop praising our God just because he's going to put up a fight. Because he doesn't give up territory very easily. And yes, we are going to have a little bit of trouble. But it's worth it! Sure, we're going to have some tough times and some rough times. But it's worth it! Because I believe that my God wants us to fight. I believe... That we were made for this purpose. That's the reason why we are here. And God wants us to, to discover it. And God wants us to put it into action and use it. For how can I endure to see the evil? That, or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? And you've got to learn that when you submit yourself to God, you also have to resist the devil. It's not just a submission process. It's also a challenging process where you resist the enemy. Now, I know that the enemy wants to try to intimidate you and back you down. And because of all the things that you're wanting God to do, sometimes he'll turn up the heat on you. And he'll make you go out and gather straw in order to make your bricks. He will put a little extra on you to see if he can get you to back down from what you really want God to do. And he'll try to break your back so you won't stand up and really declare it with the strength and the fervency of your faith. But I think it's time for us, in spite of what the enemy intimidates us with, that we stand up and fight against the enemy. Our concept of resistance is in our Western culture, the French resistance during World War II. Come on up here, enemy. And I want you to stand right there. And this is our concept of the word resistance. This is what we think about when we think of resistance. We think of the French resistance when the enemy came in and they took over the territory and they were driven underground and they were having to fight to try to gain their country back. And they were in a defensive position. And most of us consider that our position. The enemy comes and punches on us and beats up on us just a little bit. And we just want to put up a defense and say, now, come on, devil, I didn't mean it that much. I, I, I'm not going to try to praise God that much. I think we need to get a new spirit because that word resistance does not mean to defend. It means to fight back. You know what I'm going to do in the Holy Ghost? I'm going to hit back in Jesus' name. Come on, you might hit me and it might hurt, but I'm hitting back in the name of the Lord. I'm not stopping just because there's a little trouble in the house. How can I endure? I can't take it any other way. I think there ought to come a fight back in our spirit that we believe this message with all of our soul, mind, and strength. Come on, let them call us a cult if they want to. But I still believe you got to get baptized in Jesus' name and be filled with the Holy Ghost and live a holy and a godly life. Come on, it's still the message and somebody needs to hit back. Well, has all the fight drained out of us? Has all the passion drained out of us? We don't have any kick left and we don't have any fight left. It's time to rise up in the name of Jesus and say we were made to see this happen. But the last thing that she did is that she reversed the curse. She knew that she had a law in action there. And a higher law had to be published to counteract it. That higher law just simply said this on a certain, certain date. When everybody's going to gather together to kill the Jews. Jews, I'm going to give you permission 
the fight. She reversed the curse by applying the higher law. And that's exactly what we've got to do. There's the law of sin and death that works in every one of us and keeps us down. But there's a higher law than the law of sin and death. And it's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the law that we can apply. That's the higher law than the law of sin and death. The law of gravity keeps every one of us held to this earth. But there's a higher law than the law of gravity. It's the law of aerodynamics. And when your wings are set at a certain angle, and there's enough power behind you, the very thing that's trying to hold you down begins to pick you up and lift you to a higher realm. I think we ought to apply this higher law and say, God, I'm not going to close off, but I'm going to open myself up and pour myself out unto you. I think everybody in this house ought to just lift their hands and just open themselves up and say, God, I'm going to pour myself out to you. Come on, pour yourself out to the Almighty. Don't close off. Don't hide from your mission. Don't hide from the purpose that God has called you to do. But open yourself. Please the king and watch what will happen. But there's something here in this story that I, I just need to tell you about. There's something very powerful. And it's helped me in my walk in life with God. And I want to share it with you. That after they applied this higher law and they published it to all of the provinces and the Jews rose up and they fought on their own behalf. And God gave them the victory. That Esther decided she was going to start a new feast. And they called that feast the Feast of Purim. Now the word Purim in the Hebrew language, or the word poor means lots. And sometimes the lot that seems to be thrown our way, or the dice that seems to be cast, is not a very good one. We can't choose what we were raised in, and we can't always choose the circumstances we're having to go through. And there are times that a lot is sent our way that's not a very good one. Their lot looked like they were going to be destroyed because Haman crafted this lot and he did it very carefully and he did it very craftily. And he did it with a purpose because he wanted to destroy all the Jews in the provinces of the Babylonian Empire. And I want you to understand something. That that word Purim, when they added that last syllable to the word, they changed it all up because it means a lot that has been broken. The word picture that goes with it is that of a wine press, of grapes being put in a wine press, and someone treading out the wine press and turning the grapes into something better. I want you to understand that it doesn't make any difference what lot the enemy has cast your way. You can put it in the wine press of God's purpose and God's Word, and He can change it into something better. I don't care what the enemy has cast your way, what pain, what hurt has been cast your way that may not be your doing. You may not have done anything to get in this circumstance, but you're in it. The devil has crafted this lot very carefully, and he's ensnared you with it. I promise you that according to my Bible, my God treads out the wine press alone. If you'll bring it to his wine press, he'll break it, he'll tread it out, and he'll make something better out of it. That's the reason why there's still some fight left in me, because I believe that this lot that the enemy has crafted to try to bring us down and ensnare us can be broken by the power of Jesus Christ. Come on, I don't care what the situation is. I want you to bring your lot right now and put it in the wine press and begin to rejoice in the Lord and say, God, I'm nothing without you, but I'm not going to close myself off. I'm going to open myself up right now and whatever you want to do with me, you do it. I want to pour myself out for your purpose. 
But Brother Kinsey, you don't understand what's going on. Uh, bring your lot right now and watch what God can do with it. If He can break it, uh, He can turn it into something better right now. If you'll just give it to Him, uh, He'll turn it around. You say, Brother Kinsey, uh, I don't think that I can come out of uh, what I was raised in. Oh, yes, you can. You can come out of anything. Uh, if you'll believe God right now, you can come out of anything. Uh, that lot can be broken. My dad never served the Lord. He blew cigarette smoke in my face uh, until he died when I was the age of 17. Uh, but I want you to know I've never touched a cigarette to my lips and don't ever intend to uh, because God can keep you. I want you to know that we've all feel in this spirit right now that God's got something for every one of us, a mission, a purpose, and He's just waiting on you to bring the lot that the enemy has crafted very carefully, very skillfully, but we can break it. We can break it. You say, but there's just something holding me captive and I can't seem to break out of it. We're going to break it right now in Jesus' name. You say, but I've tried, Brother Kinsey. I've done this worship thing. I've done the praise thing. I've been faithful. I've done this, but I still feel bound and I just can't break out of it. You came to the right place this afternoon because we're going to break it in the Holy Ghost. But it just seems like I preach and I preach and I'm getting nowhere. We're fixing to break it right now in the Holy Ghost. I just feel something mighty in this place. I want you to know that God has spoken to us this morning through Brother Pugh's message. And I feel that there's a breaking going on in the Holy Ghost right now. God's going to break it. But I'm in some circumstances that I don't know how I'm going to get out of. God's fixing to break it right now. Next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow. Become a servant of righteousness. Keep self pure. Be an example. Have faith in God. Follow Jesus. Put first things first. Resist temptation. Be faithful and be fruitful.